All right, maybe I will get started. So hey everyone, my name is Milian Trulov. I'm the Vice President and Dean of Admission and Financial Aid at Reed College. And uh, you joined us for Faculty Spotlight. This is our first Faculty Spotlight of the year. And um, if you've been paying any attention to any of the email messages we've sent you, you know, we'll have five of these sessions that are taking place over the next few weeks. Uh, this is a, a real treat. You're gonna get to talk to uh, the folks who you're gonna be working with in the classroom, uh, the people who are teaching here at Reed and all sorts of different disciplines. And based on what we've seen, we know that not everyone here has thought about the major of the folks represented because the purpose of tonight is not just to talk about the academic programs, uh, but it's also to get to know our faculty and figure out who the people are who will be teaching you in the classroom. Um, so I know you all have amazing options and I'm so glad that you chose Reed as your option to visit us today. And I'm gonna go around and just have our panelists introduce themselves. And then I'll go through some logistics about how tonight, uh, tonight will work. So uh, Derek, I'm gonna go alphabetical by last name. Uh, let people know who you are and um, what your area, not, not just your department, but your area of emphasis within your department. Okay, great. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, good evening or good morning or good afternoon, uh, depending on where you're from. Um, my name is Derek Applewhite. I'm a professor of biology. Um, in my field of specialty, if you will, I'm a cell biologist. Awesome. And this is going alphabetical. Sarah, you're next. Or, I'm sorry, it's Mar <laughs> Meg, you're next. Hi, everybody. I'm Meg Charlie, and I teach in the philosophy department and also in Humanities 110. And my area of specialization is on uh, ancient Greek philosophy and in particular uh, ancient Greek science. Excellent. Thank you. And Sarah. Hi, I'm Sarah Wagner McCoy. I teach in the English department and in Hume 110. Um, I do 19th and 20th century, uh, mostly fiction, um, this scene in the US, uh, but also transatlantic and Irish writing. Um, and I'm also currently the PI for a Mellon Initiative for Environmental Humanities, which I'm looking forward to talking with you all more about. Excellent, thank you all. And again, welcome to all of our families and students. I know some of you are huddled around the same monitor. And so this is a bit different. Usually we're in sessions where you'll see everyone else who's here. This is a webinar format, Zoom, which means that you and I have to talk a little bit differently than we usually do. So if you look down at your Zoom instructions, you'll see a Q&A. And so as we're having a conversation, any question that comes into your mind, go ahead and fill out a Q&A. And basically I'm gonna be gleaning, um, looking at the Q&A throughout the night. Uh, so I'll be asking my questions and I'll pepper them with a few of your questions uh, so what I'll do is um, you'll see them up for a second and then I'm going to hit dismiss and they'll disappear, which means that I've seen them. Um, so um, it'll say something like, you know, this is going to be answered live. Now, I won't be able to get to all of the questions, but that's my way of letting you know that I've seen your question. Um, and then if, um, you know, you haven't had an answer just towards the end, I'll give you some more time to do that. So um, first off, just um, for our panelists, um, collectively, you've been at Reed for a long time. <laughs> we might not talk details. But uh, one of the things that um, I often get from our students and our family members is, you know, for them, they're trying to decide why they want to go to Reed. For you, why, why do you stay at Reed? Why is this place where you enjoy teaching? What is it about this school that you found to be so magnetic or a draw for you year after year? And let's go in reverse order for um, responding. Uh, that that means me, right? The, yep. <laughs> great. You're up. Um, well, I've been at Reed for, I guess, a little over a decade now. Mm. Um, and it's an incredible place to be in part because I get to come up with ideas of what to teach based on students and the conversations I'm having with them. Um, so I was just actually talking to a couple of my students who were excited about the Environmental Humanities Initiative. Um, we actually expected it to be sort of a three year course incubator where it was a chance for faculty to do workshops, but a lot of the ideas for it came out of the conversations I was having with students about how we can respond in our different ways to um, climate crisis and uh, what are the ways that the books that we read might be an opportunity to shift our ways of thinking about place and our relationships to it. Um, how do we 
rethink our values um, and rethink our behaviors and make a change in the world through the stories that we tell um, and the conversations we have about that. And that came entirely from classes I was teaching. And so being at a place where the conversations I'm having every day with students in my classes, thesis advisees, uh, first year advisees, um, how that gets to inform what I research and what I teach, that's been really inspiring and exciting for me. Awesome, thank you, Sarah, I appreciate that. How about you, Meg? Um, for me, it was really a question of values and I wanted to be somewhere that valued teaching and saw it as integrated with scholarship. And I, I'm excited to be at Reed because I share values with my colleagues. We all are there because we want to work with students and we want to work with them directly and we want to generate ideas with them. And that was really what drew me to read. And I had a friend in graduate school who was a read graduate who was just so amazing to talk with and just this great thought partner about any topic. And so when I saw read on the list of jobs, I was like, I don't know anything thing about this place, except for the fact that there is this really dynamic person that I have been in graduate school with, and I immediately wanted to go there. That's amazing. Mm -hmm. How about you, Derek? I have to echo what my colleagues have said. I think the thing that keeps me here um, and keeps me excited is my collaboration with my students. Um, I um, love working with students in my research lab. I love working with students in my classes. Um, we get a chance to explore um, original research um, in both places. Um, their thoughts and their ideas fuel my research program, um, and they are true collaborators with what I do. And um, that's really what's kept me here. It's 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 been my relationship with the students I've worked with, mm -hmm. and also I have very great colleagues. Yeah, one of the things that. Um... I try not to say, and I avoid it <laughs> if I can, is this, um, it feels like a cliche statement, you'll get to know your faculty, right? Um, there are a lot of small private liberal arts schools where that student to faculty ratio is, is like us nine to one. Well, maybe not that not, not low, but what, what does that really mean in practice? Uh, when you think, because Derek, you alluded to this, when you think about your relationships, connecting with students, why is that important? Why is that a value? But more importantly, let's unpack that without using that, those words and talk a little bit about what that means. I mean, I am a part of our, my students' lives and their academic lives at the very least. And so I do know them um, quite well, particularly my thesis students. You know, I, I meet with them several times a week I um, mean, we have a you know lab meeting. And what's, we have what's thesis, meeting. Derek? Oh yeah, thank you. Uh, senior thesis is a, a graduate a graduation requirement, but it's basically a year on exploration, a year long exploration, um, and kind of the culmination of your experience at Reed, where you get to um, the reins are let go, and the students get to do um, research um, depending on their discipline um, for an entire year. Um, and put together a, a document um, and have to defend said document in front of a panel for professors um, like ourselves. So mm -hmm. it, it's quite the experience. Um, it's akin to a master's thesis in some cases. It's it's quite, um, that's that's kind of the level we're kind of operating at, which is it's quite impressive. It still remains to be quite impressive to me. Um, but that being said, so what my students are working in my research lab and we meet several times a, a day. And you know, I pop in and check and see what's going on and oh, I'm having trouble with this. And so we have a conversation about that. And then I pop in another day and I'm helping another student do other things. And then we talk about, oh, the future and they're, you know, they're trying to apply for grad school or they're looking for jobs. So we talk about that or um, I'm looking for an internship next summer. Do you have any ideas? Oh, I have a colleague who does this. Let's maybe see if they have an opening. So like we have this relationship where it's kind of ongoing and um, we're working, you know, working hand in hand. Um, and, and that's does it, it's not just my thesis students. I also have a pretty close relationship with my students in my class. Um, you know, we know everyone's name. Um, they know our name. Um, we have we have a relationship in the classroom, um, and it's built on a, a lot of trust um, and a lot of. Um, uh, I think that is the, I guess that's probably the, the best word to say. And um, mm -hmm. um, yeah, it, it it you know, 
without saying the cliche things, I, I, you know, we do end up knowing our students quite well. Yeah, absolutely. And I can, I mean, I can jump in. I just on the on the tail of that because I'll give you a specific example. This happened yesterday. We were watching a movie for a, we're doing a movie analysis in Humanities 110, which is a course that every first year student takes. We were doing this analysis, and I said, "Okay, let's let's break this up." You know, somebody can focus on you know the soundscape and i said hey fritz you play the drums i bet you would like to do that part anyway it's just an example where i know my students i know i know them because i've worked with them on their papers and then i get to know kind of what their interests are and i can kind of help them see how to connect what they're interested in with whatever work we're doing and then i thought again here's another example then today's class I'm in there and a student made a comment and I was like, oh, now that makes sense that you're looking at it that way because you have this other project that I know about outside of this class. And that makes sense that you're you know, investigating in this way. And hey, there's an article I'm gonna send you after class. So mm -hmm. I have a kind of wider scope of, of knowledge of the students, whether that be extracurricular things are involved with or other intellectual projects they're in, invested in. And so I can kind of help them bring the threads together of those things and that matters. Um, mm -hmm. So I think that's important. I, I'd be, oh, sorry, go ahead, Sarah. No, oh, I can, It's it, maybe it's just similar to what others have been saying. I'm thinking back one of the graduation speakers when I was at Harvard where I was doing my PhD and I was also actually a first year um, live-in advisor there. Um, and part of what made me want to come to a place like Reed was a joke that one of our graduation speakers at Harvard made, which was, you know, at Harvard, you really get to know your professors and what they look like. Tiny dots. Um, <laughs> and it, it got a big laugh. It was, you know, because it's a tiny dot at the front of the lecture hall. Um, and of course, what I loved about being there was being a live-in advisor and actually really getting to know my students and having our weekly study breaks and our movie nights and our um, capture the flag in the snow and that kind of thing, but that wasn't what faculty did. Um, here, I have a chance, you know, in, in HUME 110, I get to know every first year student in these one-on-one -on -one paper conferences. I've been doing that with my Irish drama class uh, this week where we just had, you know, we were performing scenes from Riders to the Sea, this very depressing um, J.M. Singh play about the Aran Islands and one horrible death at sea after another and bringing the body back in. Um, you know, that, that's one way to get to know folks, but people were talking in character afterwards. We did a talk back where they were sitting at the front of the stage and we had different directors making different directorial decisions. This fall, I got to take my students from my environmental humanities class on a field trip. And we did an overnight uh, visit to the San Juan Islands where we went sea kayaking the next day. Mm. We started out though, um, getting to talk to one of my oldest friends um, whom I met at a really cool, immersive place-based learning uh, experience in high school. She's now a water analyst with the Swinomish Department of Environmental Protection. And she was able to introduce me to her supervisor who's the director there and is one of the major figures in the region right now for thinking about the land back movement. Um, and it's the first, he's, he's currently uh, working as the first, uh, the, the first co-managed state park uh, that's co-managed by a federally recognized tribe that uh, they've been doing a lot of incredible work through that. But some of my students from that class told me that watching me and the sustainability head um, <laughs> try to broadcast our dishwater after our first night where we were making nachos and the wind picked up and <laughs> managed to sweep back this bean and cheese filled water on both of us and our one changes of clothes. Yeah. And then the two of us couldn't stop laughing. And I think getting to see your professor, that's very different from the tiny dot. I'm not sure it's a good thing. It wasn't a high point, <laughs> although it was pretty funny to see it just swoop over and land on our head. And we both had bits of bean and salsa and sour, sour yeah, cream. That's the true Art. definition of tight knit. Yeah, that, that was tight knit. <laughs> that was a tight knit class, I'd say. It, um, I'd be remiss if I didn't ask you all a little bit about your departments. And so, um, um, I'll, I'll ask this, not all of you to answer right now. I'll have just one person go now and I'll have another person go later. But um, if you're thinking about your department, we have students who are looking at, you know, great departments nationally. Um, if you really needed to give them an idea of what um, makes what makes your department distinctive, 
um, when you think about what you and your colleagues do for the classroom, how would you describe it? Um, give folks an idea of, um, you know, uh, it doesn't have to be breadth, but it doesn't have to be depth, but something that'll help them sort of uh, remember and understand what they might do as a biology major, as a philosophy major, you name it. And um, I'll, one person go now, and then I'll have the other two think about it, and I'll have you answer later on. Okay, I can go. Great. My colleagues don't mind. Um, I think the thing that I think about the biology department and what we do best is we train scientists the way scientists actually work and think. Um, I think there's a lot of canned ways of teaching science in most institutions, and this is not one of those places. I think our students do inquiry-based, real research. Um, I published a paper with one of my, with several classes worth of, of data. We published a paper this last October. Um, so this was research. I had no clue what the answer was. We were all exploring it together um, and we published a scientific article. So my students are learning, our students are learning how to do science the way science is actually done. And that's not typical of a biology department at an undergrad institution. What, what is more typical and why the difference between the two? I mean, I could, I could speak to my experience as an undergrad in biology, and we were given um, what we call canned labs where, you know, the answer is pretty much right there. It's already known. Um, it's taking you through a, a few steps. Maybe you're learning on a pipette or what have you, but you're not really doing anything that's new. It's just a lab that's the answer is already known. You're going to figure it out. You're going to see it. You get graded whether you get the right answer or not, which is not how science works at all. Um, so it, it's just a completely different experience um, than this, the experience that read students get. Yeah, I can attest to, um, to that based on what a student shared with us on Monday at a panel who was a religion major that said, uh, Reed taught me about how to ask questions, not what to think, but how to solve these problems. And this sort of method, as you said, of inquiry, uh, and it's not just biology sort of across the board. So that, that's great. And Sarah and, and Meg, I'll ask you that soon. But first, um, I have a really critical question for you, Meg. If Reed were a philosopher, who would Reed be and why? <laughs> oh, no. Oh. You knew it was coming. <laughs> I love the look on, of dread on your face. No, I know. I have to think of it. I feel like I'm on a... Um... Yeah, I'm on, I don't know. I don't know what I'm on. Am I on a game show? Am I on a talk show? I don't know which <laughs> show I'm on, but now all of a sudden I've got to, if uh, we were a philosopher, I'm yeah. see, of course I'm trying to come up with some, some clever answer. Um, <laughs> well, yeah, I guess, I mean, it, it's kind of easy to say Socrates, but you could also say Sorwana. Mm. Um, and Sorwana is um, a nun in, from uh, Mexico City. It, it, she, we read her in um, the Mexico City section of the Human 10 course. Um, and what she was partly, I mean, she herself is kind of thinking back to her predecessors and including Socrates and trying to distinguish herself from that tradition, but also engage it. Um, and so she's kind of playing with the idea of what is it to do philosophy in this kind of embodied way? Mm. Um, because she recognizes that at, at that time um, that there aren't, you know, she's seen as this rare bird a woman who is engaging in an intellectual activity um, and is kind of almost like a curiosity to people. Mm -hmm. and, and so she's kind of playing with the idea of what it is to be an embodied philosopher and how is that different than just doing what Socrates was doing. So mm -hmm. I guess that's, that's, I think Reed could be Sorwana. <laughs> I like it. Two thumbs up. Mm -hmm. um, Sarah, you're next. If we were <laughs> a 19th or an 18th century author, uh, who would read B and Y? 
Oh, wow. I was really enjoying laughing when Meg was trying to answer the question. <laughs> it's different when you're not under this bottle, um, right? <laughs> I know. Well, so I feel like there is a, a hmm. Okay, I'm going to go with uh, one that I would not have necessarily said even like a few weeks ago, but I'm thinking about a conversation I was just having with some students about uh, Rachel Carson, who wrote Silent Spring, which is the book that's uh, mm. credited with starting the environmental movement. Um, and a lot of people will talk about this in terms of what's known as the information deficit model, that she was informing the public about the consequences of DDT and the chemical industry poisoning the earth. Um, and it wasn't insecticides, it was biocides, it was killing life on earth, and it was going to go up the chain. Um, I actually think what's most interesting about the book, though, is she was almost an English major. She switched over to bio. So I was thinking about this as Derek was speaking. Um, but she started out, she's very interested. This title comes from a, a Keats poem, uh, La Belle Dame Sans Merci, this kind of romantic chivalric fantasy of dream visions, which is sort of like Sorwana as well, sort of merging um, Socratic inquiry with uh, an idea of sort of a, a, an embodied, but also a, a dream, um, a, a visionary possibility. Mm. Um, she begins with this kind of perplexing fairy tale esque chapter called A Fable for Tomorrow. Mm. Uh, she employs a lot of images from uh, ancient Greek tragedy and um, she talks about Medea and the poison cloak, uh, other texts we actually read in Hume. And so thinking about someone who can merge all of these different discourses to make a persuasive argument, to try to do something that matters. Um, she, she's a constant reviser, a, a brilliant writer. I mean, just a really thoughtful stylist. Um, she, her editors would sort of laugh about how they never needed to make any changes because she'd already thought through every possible <laughs> thing. She really, she asks questions. She's genuinely interested. She's, she's interested in experimental method. She goes out and figures things out for herself. She questions authority. Um, but she does so in every discipline. You know, she's just, she, she has a kind of incredible capaciousness in her writing. Um, and her impact is kind of hard to overstate. Uh, but yeah, I guess maybe she would be uh, who I would enlist as a, as a reedy. <laughs> there are also oh, great response. And Rachel, and, writer, so. and Rachel? Rachel Carson, Silent yeah. Spring is her most famous work. The expose DDT. Thank you for that. Couldn't have answered it by myself. Oh, I couldn't have answered it myself. <laughs> uh, Derek, now it's your turn. Yeah, um, so I, I, if I got... Reed were, mine is different though for you. Oh, okay, good. Okay, great. All right. Okay. Oh, <laughs> if Reed were a cell, a cell in the body, what, which cell would it be? Ooh, well, let me actually dive deeper than that because oh, yeah. I think where we where analogies are would probably hold more true. It would be if Reed were an organelle within a cell. Right? Tell me about that. Yeah. Well, I mean, cells have tiny little molecular machines that are inside of them. Um, and these these molecular machines are what produce the things that cells produce um, from neurotransmitters to insulin to muscle contraction. These, um, these molecular machines work together um, so that cells can function. And if I had to narrow down a single um, organelle, um, I'm gonna say the endoplasmic reticulum, which I'm sure a lot of people who have had biology, at least in high school, have at least heard that word. Um, but I'm not sure everyone's super familiar with what actually the ER does. Um, it produces the majority of the lipids for cells. It produces, um, ships and packages the majority of secreted proteins and membrane-bound proteins. Um, and it touches just about every single organelle in the cell. And I say that because um, we don't produce students that, um, that kind of have, uh, they have a wide breadth. They can have, um, have this passion in say cell biology, but also well-versed in philosophy um, and can um, also uh, learned Taekwondo while they were at Reed. I mean, so we, they, all of these things make up our students. Our students are just, um, they're jacks of all trades. They're Renaissance people. Um, there's not just one focus they have. It's that they, they are, they're exposed and um, are, 
uh, are expansive and and um, can can talk with just about anybody you know down the street um, because of their just the wide range of things that they are involved in and are um, taught and you know take in um, while they're here. If that makes any sense. Can, can I jump on Derek's train for a second because yeah. I have a good example of what you're talking about? Because you said biology and philosophy, and yes. <laughs> because I had a student who is a biology major and took my my course um, in which we we read some literature on philosophy of disability. Mm. And mm. it totally changed the way that she thought about what she was going to do next. And um, she came to me and she was just like, I, I'm seeing my future career in medicine in a totally different way. And I said, well, I have funding. Do you want to start a bioethics club? Yeah, yeah. And she was like, yeah, that sounds great. So she did all that. And um, then one of, the, one of my friends who's at OHSU, she invited to give a talk. And then he, he was just so impressed with the Reed students. He was like, this, you know, this place is amazing. He's like, I wanna, you know, bring Reed students over to OHSU, not only for, you know, doing science, science but yeah. doing other things. And long story short, uh, she has decided to go for bioethics before she goes to med school. Mm -hmm. And she just got accepted to Harvard, NYU and multiple places. And so she's making those decisions right now. So it did change her life to do the breath. She just thought about her career and her whole engagement with biology in a totally different way. Mm -hmm. um, truly liberal arts. And, and one, um, in some ways, that was an intentional question because I think what I enjoy about listening to you, the faculty, is your ability to take complicated information and help students make connections. And through that teaching experience, this teaching ex exercise, I hope students can gain some enthusiasm for the kind of atmosphere that you'll create in the classroom. You know, I I want to read Rachel Carson now. <laughs> this is this is a, this is someone who's made it to my read list, and this is what happens for students every day. And Meg, I, I think um, you know, I've heard one of our faculty say um, for my students. Um, I, I, I imagine a future for them that they could not imagine for themselves. I'm hearing that in terms of you all making connections for them. And because you are talking about um, interdisciplinary collaborating between departments, I'm gonna combine a couple of the questions that we received. Um, and I just need maybe one or two people to answer this because I think it's a really direct question. Um, let's see, let me... So folks are curious about the important nature of interdisciplinary skills and how faculty collaborate and work together. Um, I think I'm gonna summarize it in that way. Do you think you all can um, speak to that or maybe give an example that um, embodies what you see at the college overall? I can speak a little bit to that. Um, mm -hmm. One thing is, I one of the exciting things that has come out of the initiative that we're running right now is that I'm really re recognizing that while faculty spend a lot of time thinking about how to plan a great class, a lot of the most important sites of learning are the moments when for students sparks are happening in between what they're doing in one class and what they're doing in another. And a question I asked um, at a dinner recently with a number of colleagues was, what's a great thing that happened in your class recently that had nothing to do with your class, that had something to do with something someone else was teaching? And the example that came up for three of us was a lichens class where mm -hmm. all of these students have been climbing trees and looking at light. I mean, in my case, it was, we were doing these beach monitoring exercises at Swinomish that were all about the importance of balancing cultural and ecological needs. Um, how do you create a community gathering space without harming a fragile ecosystem? And are there alternative substrates to gravel? And so here are my students going around measuring erosion and deposits and um, and what we in salinity. And what we realized at the end is it was it was a way of figuring out a solution to a concrete problem, but in the process recognizing the importance of seeing different perspectives on what mattered rather than just saying, oh, you can't drive there. 
That's not, that's a no-go. We're protecting this spot. In the process, there were all of these barnacles on a living tree, which was unheard of. And this led to, you know, photo, three of my students were taking photographs and sending them to their professor. Their professor is emailing us back and we're, you know, we're on a camping trip getting updates from about lichen. And it was just amazing to see barnacles and lichen in the same place and what could it be? And they were so curious. Mm. And so there were learning outcomes for my class, but hand in hand with that was a whole new topic. And then later in the semester, I found a a link to a website. There was just a sign with a QR code, and it was students from the Lichens class who had started writing poems to Lichen, and it was beautiful. And so those are just these small moments. I think the larger consequence is being at a small institution where people feel so passionate about what they do and where the conversations are everywhere um, with faculty, with students. The connections are always there. And the conversations are always happening. And I think being at a place too, where the, the real core of student life is this kind of intellectual experience um, mm -hmm. and the community that comes of it. What people are talking about is not a fraternity party or a sports team. What people are talking about is lichen or a trip and who they met there and who they got to hear at the recent speaker or a lecture. I think those kinds of conversations and the, the kinds of um, student communities that emerge from that. Um, mm -hmm. That to me is what fosters a sense of connectedness in the learning that we do. Thank you. Derek, Meg, anything to add? Um, I would think my biggest collaborator is um, a computational biologist, a uh, computer scientist. Um, and I can't think of anything more interdisciplinary than that. Um, my colleague Anna and I have written um, several grants together um, we've written several papers together, um, and it's just a person I never imagined I would be collaborating with until I got to read, um, mm -hmm. and has really shaped my career as a cell biologist, um, my collaboration with Anna. So um, I've had thesis students that were physics and biology, so biophysicists, which isn't too um, out of the ordinary, but I've definitely had thesis students that were also biology theater, you know, and what came out of their thesis was this collaboration I had with, you know, my colleague in theater, um, uh, Kate Bredesen, said we this student created a a, theater, a play done over Zoom because this was COVID about the first year science experience, and it really reflected back to the biology faculty how students were receiving um, that class, um, and so it was very enlightening. And so these types of collaborations happen all the time, and and much like Sarah said, they're often driven by the students themselves who are seeing the connections and bringing people together. I, I don't know that I would have ever collaborated with Kate. I love Kate. We're, we're friends outside of college, uh, outside of the school, but I never thought I would collaborate with her on any type of project because I didn't I didn't know where we would intersect. Um, but it was the students that brought us there. Um, and it was really a beautiful thing. That's a great example. Um, is the, so I'm gonna sort of combine these two questions. And I think we get um, both of these um, often enough where we could sort of give the sort of two, three sentence answer to each sections of these. And one or two people may, may, may um, uh, speak to this. Um, what did we learn during the pandemic in terms of teaching? And how are we thinking about AI and teaching? Which I will acknowledge is um, a potentially broad topic, but I think, which is to say it's variable, but if you could say one or two sentences about that. Go ahead, I mean, Meg. I was on sabbatical during the, I was on sabbatical during the pandemic. So I, I'll let you all answer that. Okay. The other, the other thing, um, but AI in teaching, we are actually hosting an AALAC conference on artificial intelligence this summer. And what do those it, acronyms mean, Meg? Okay, now, <laughs> well, what is that organization quiz do? show, <laughs> American Academy of Liberal <laughs> Arts Colleges. Oh, I think I got it. Yeah. And what now do, what do I get? Million, where's my prize? Uh, I'll send you some Reed swag. You will, actually. <laughs> I'll give you some okay, socks. Good. You know I will, too. I know. I've got those socks. <laughs> um, so, yes. So we're having this um, conference this summer. We're talking about collaborating as a college. What opportunities are there for us to think about our research and how it relates to artificial intelligence? And then also opportunities to think about 
what kind of curricula could we develop around um, these issues? So, mm. and we're, we're hosting it at Reed, but it will be people from um, multiple liberal arts colleges that are coming to Reed to talk about this very thing. Derek, Sarah, did you learn anything about teaching during the pandemic, stylistically or philosophically? How much? What I will say, because yeah. for us, it seems so common hand, Reed was fantastic during the pandemic, which is to say that um, while we were in person, um, it was one of the safest places to be in the city. Um, folks were thoughtful. We had three tents outside that faculty could teach in. You had an app where you could order food. The one example I give is dance classes. Um, you walked into the dance room and there are areas that were taped off with appropriate distancing and every student had their own big screen monitor so they can interact with the faculty member. It was great to know that we were resourced enough to provide testing on campus, to provide eight big screen TVs for folks to be in a room so they could continue to learn together. And, um, you know, we shifted. And there are a lot of folks that we, we can't do this. This is going to be terrible. And while challenging, you know, I think that um, when I looked at the landscape of other colleges, I was really proud of what we did. Um, having said that, it was different doing this for half of your classes or figuring out, Derek, how you would do labs. So when you reflect on that time, getting information to students using these different methods, Sarah, same for you. Is there anything that you take away from that time? I mean, I, I learned um, that, you know, a lot can be done um, via this interface that we're currently using um, and that we can actually reach people um, and have conversations and, um, and, and have a, a relationship through a monitor. Um, I think I didn't think it was possible. I will say that also during the pandemic, what I learned was how important being in the same room with people is and how important that yeah. personal um, interaction that we now are back to having on a regular basis is. Um, so I think my biggest takeaway is how important it is the way we do things and how, how much that helps people actually learn. Um, I think that's my biggest takeaway, honestly, is that we need that personal touch. We need the, that personal interaction that can't necessarily be done over this um, platform. I think I would add, I like Meg, I was on, I actually had a research grant. So I was the only one who came back and was like, how does Skype work, you guys? And I was a little late to it, but but we did have, I was doing a community engaged learning class um, on a separate grant when I, um, when the Delta variant hit. And so I had this whole elaborate partnership planned with different local nonprofits and the public schools in North Portland. And then about a few weeks before classes, everything had to move back online for a while. Um, and it was a tricky semester because it was sort of stop, start, stop, start. It seemed like things were gonna be fine. I had all these plans lined up and then we couldn't do that. Um, I think an upside though was, you know, the program we were gonna partner with got canceled and it actually forced us to just think differently about what a community partnership could be. And so I engaged with a number of contacts who were doing public facing humanities works in digital humanities, in theater, in legal activism. And I asked them if they would Zoom with our class. And that way, instead of it being, I'm sorry, we can't meet in person, it was like, well, one thing we can do with Zoom is meet with someone who's you know, internationally renowned and across the country. And so that was sort of a making lemonade moment. Mm -hmm. Another thing that came out of that though, was recognizing often in the past, we had thought of speakers as sort of, you can bring someone in to talk. So thinking about AI, we have a great speaker coming in religion and anthropology in a couple of weeks, who's gonna be talking about AI and ethics. We have an amazing person coming a week before that uh, in um, from history of science and um, talking about black futurism and androids. So mm -hmm. we have a lot of great speakers coming in Having that shift to Zoom, but having it be with people I knew, what that's morphed into in my classes is having a speaker series in which it's an ongoing relationship with the students. So leading up to having a guest speaker, this time in person, my students communicate with that speaker over Google Docs and they all collectively oh. annotate something. 
and they prep questions. And then in between the public talk, which is a big lecture for the audience and the Q&A, the question and answer session, my students from that class actually lead discussion groups. So it's like we're bringing the read conference to members of the public who show up for the talk. And so that's what we did as a pilot in my speaker series this fall. And it was a way of kind of taking some of the tools from the Zoom era um, and, and making them work to create an ongoing conversation that could actually enhance a visit from a, a guest lecturer or an expert. And mm. so I think finding some things that worked or didn't work, I think like Derek, I'm very happy to be back in person, but there are some really cool opportunities that can come out of that. and the possibility to connect with a wider world has been, I think, one of the upsides. Absolutely. So before I forget, um, I want to give either you, Meg, or Sarah an opportunity to talk about the department. And you know, what I um, said, if folks remember earlier, was um, if folks were to, to understand Reed's, your department at Reed in particular, what's distinctive, whether it's depth or breadth, how you would describe it to folks so they have this distinctive picture of what they would get here that they may not or may receive somewhere else, but that's special for us. Um, thanks, Sarah. Do either of you want to? I can jump in. Um, oh. Yeah. Oh. So I, I, we do a really good job. Of, my folks, what your department is? Sorry. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Philosophy. Philosophy. <laughs> so um, just like Derek, we get down to the organelle in, in <laughs> arguments. Okay. So we take we take you might you know think of a think of an argument like a you know like a body you're about to do a uh as a procedure on <laughs> so you're looking like how is the heart connected with the lungs you know connected with the kidneys and whatever and you're trying to see how the argument works because you and i might agree on the heart but we might disagree on the pancreas and we, but we need to know how they're all connected in order to know how the argument works. But once you identify the area of disagreement, then we can have a real discussion about that. Like, well, what's your argument for that? And what's my argument for that? So we do a really great job of that kind of exercise. And, you know, this is good for life. Don't you wanna know how people are arguing for things and how we can, how we can find points of agreement and disagreement and then figure out how to gauge each other on those things um and but thinking about what's distinctive of our department as far as opportunities goes uh you know students write a senior thesis they do original work and they also sometimes have opportunities to do research grants so i've worked with students um on research grants our department so there's two options well more than two but i'll tell you about two um one is you can co author something with a professor over the summer. And um, I had a student, I've had two students that I've done this with. The first one I took to the American Philosophical Association meeting and we co-presented. This student was, in fact, most of these meetings don't even have graduate students presenting, but this person was the only undergraduate at the whole place. I mean, it's an enormous convention. It's the only undergraduate. But I had the student um, and I present the paper and then and for the question and answer, I sat down and the student handled the entire question and answer mm -hmm. and um, did an amazing job. And people loved it and they invited the student to come out with them afterwards. So it was really exciting. Um, another opportunity we have in the philosophy department is if you want to work on a project over the summer, we will give you money so that you don't have to have a regular job out in the community. You can you can um, have that time and space to work on a project of philosophical interest to you. And we had two recipients of that last summer, and one of them I'm working with on a senior thesis this year. So those are really, really great opportunities. Um, I've taken students to other conferences as well, where there's literally no student of any kind, and they've thrived in those circumstances. So. Mm. Thank you, Mac. And what I, I just shared out to um... Uh, in the Q&A, someone said, what are the most popular programs? So what I gave you was the most highly represented programs uh, for the incoming class. And the reason I, I, I said that, and I want to specify for everyone, is because 
Um, this, uh, size doesn't matter for our programs and their strength in the curriculum. Um, you know, I think our faculty know this, Reed produces more PhDs per capita than any other school in the United States except for three, uh, Caltech, MIT, and we go back and forth with Swarthmore. So that's more PhDs per 100 students than, than Harvard, Stanford, uh, Yale, you name it. And so, um, and even, uh, and I talk about linguistics because it's a smaller program usually, but even linguistics is one of the top 10 producers of PhDs per capita. And so I don't want people to think, oh, big program means good program. If you do well at Reed, you will do well anywhere. Every program has depth and resources. I was once touring the art department and I sort of went through the building. They kept saying, no, we have a kiln here. We have this equipment over here and this equipment there. I said, is there anything you don't do? And uh, the faculty member paused and said, really, really small metal work. But I was like, is that, is that it? You know, so nothing else. And so um, I'm going to connect this to, to one of the questions our students have, which is um, uh, quality is not just research, right? And it's not just y'all doing research, connecting with faculty, but you do research here at the small private liberal arts school and, and students probably have bigger opportunities to make to what you alluded to than they do if there were 20 students. So we have a student that says, hey, can you give me an idea of the research, the independent research, the stuff I might do to sort of, you know, get more seeped into my field? If that could be the short part of your answer and then you spend some time on how a student actually falls into that, like they get here, what do they do to actually do research? Um, if we could have someone speak to that, that would be great. I can take a stab at it, which is the first step is come to office hours. Um, if there's someone working on something that you're excited to learn more about, come talk to us. We love talking about what we're working on. Um, and they're often, as Meg mentioned, really great opportunities. The Ruby Langford grant over the summer, I did that with a student. I took her with me to some archives where I'm working on archival recovery of an author who's really major um, and yet less than a third of his short stories are in print. He actually found one of the missing stories while we were there. It was incredible. <laughs> um, so there are opportunities like that through these funded summer programs. But I think the first step is to build those connections. And I think Reed is set up in a way that really encourages those moments to happen right off the bat. So you have your Hume professor who is going to be meeting with you one-on-one -on -one regularly, you're going to have a chance to get to know them and learn more about the different programs in, in that course, which is team taught and interdisciplinary. You're going to have a first year advisor who's also going to be able to connect you. So if, if the faculty member or staff member you're talking to doesn't work on the thing you want, they can certainly introduce you to a person who does. And I think that's the kind of thing that that's why we're all here. We're here because we want to help you make those connections. So I think, yeah, just, come say hi and take it from there would be my advice. I had a student um, walk into my office about two, three weeks ago, two weeks ago, and said, I want to work on neurons. And I've never met this student. And mm. I don't know the student from, because I, I, I'm not teaching in the introductory biology course this semester or last semester. And the student always had his interbio and sat in my office and said, I want to work on neurons. And I said, Okay, <laughs> and so now he's working in my lab on neurons. You know, so <laughs> that's literally what happened. I, I'm I'm not kidding you. Uh, um, so that that's as Sarah said, come to office hours. I, students, you'll be surprised. You know, I, I had the space and the capacity in my lab, and and that's what happened. And um, you know, bio biology department's quite lucky. There there are several different avenues to do summer research in the department. Um, we have probably twenty five to thirty students every summer working in our labs doing research. And they're funded through a whole bunch of different um, pathways, which is not really important to talk about. But that all started with just people coming in and making conversation and having and starting up a relationship with the professor and um, shooting back ideas and um, sharing enthusiasm, really. Yeah, I had a funny moment where I got a phone call. I, I gave a talk about the initiative I'm working on. And um, I got a phone call from someone who was in the audience, I guess who was an alumni who was a chemist. Who had called the Center for Life Beyond Read and said, we, "I'm the director of a nonprofit. Um, I'm a chemistry PhD, and and I'd like to set up a paid internship for a Read student this summer." And they said, "Oh, we'll put you in touch with the chemistry department." And 
this person said, no, I want to talk to the English department. I want a storyteller. And I was like, thank you for coming to my talk. <laughs> so there are these moments like that, I think that really capture the interdisciplinarity. Um, but, you know, I, I, I think what's exciting is it's not, here's my lab and you can copy what I do or work for me. A lot of these opportunities are students come in with an idea or yeah. students come in with a question better yet. And then we start a conversation. Here's something I care about. Here's something that matters to me. Here's something I want to change in the world. What do we do? That's a, that's a starting point. And I think that's really exciting when that takes off. And there are a lot of ways to make that happen. So I'll acknowledge I, um, we are coming to the end of the session. We're a few minutes over, but we're going to wrap this up in the next um, three to four minutes. Uh, first thing I'm going to do is Sarah, I would love for you to do your uh, summary of the English department so folks can understand it. Then I'm going to quickly rapid answer some of these questions that we didn't get to that I think are just really short. And then I'm going to ask our faculty one more really brief question and then we'll be done. Um, and again, this recording will be available later on. It takes about a week to sort of edit and get it together. So you don't have to watch all you know 50 minutes of it. But um, Sarah, why don't you begin with uh, the, the English department? Sure. Uh, just really quickly, uh, we have a creative writing faculty and critical writing faculty, but a lot of that is uh, put together. So often in a critical class, I'll ask students, how else could the author have written this? Or we'll even do creative exercises to think about why a choice might have been made and why it's significant. Um, we teach our introductory levels as genre classes, so people will get a pretty wide range of courses in drama and poetry and fiction. Um, in travel writing, even uh, film, uh, and then film and media and games. There's actually a class on games right now that's very popular. Um, and then at the upper level, they're often more problem based or kind of broader questions. Uh, the senior thesis, like in all departments, is a chance to work closely one on one with a faculty member you're excited to work with. But importantly, it's whatever you choose to work on. So students get to create their own project based on something they're passionate about and um, then connect with someone to advise that thesis. So happy to answer other questions as well. But I think that's sort of a quick overview of English. It's a it's a wonderful community. We all teach all sorts of classes in convert. We have everything from sort of Tolkien and um, early uh, Middle English to um, Indian Ocean fictions and post-colonial hauntings. Um, yeah, we have a wide range of courses and I would encourage you to look at the website and the course catalog. We had a great question earlier asking how many faculty in the English department, I just counted the names. I know some are full-time tenured faculty, some are visitors, but our visitors are here full-time, which is, which is different than at some schools, but there are 22 and some are sometimes on sabbatical, um, but significantly sized department. Uh, really quickly, I'm going to answer a few of these questions. <clears throat> so, um, do, 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 do. how are applications evaluated? Um, we'll spend a lot of time on your high school transcript, making sure that you've taken a rigorous course load and performed well in those classes, but it's a holistic admission process, so how you contribute to community is important. Um, let's see, we did talk about the ways of teaching, sort of we talked about that inquiry-based teaching and helping people uh, understand how to think. Um, the intersection between biology and psychology and neuroscience. Um, join us um, in um, late March, early April. We will do a deeper dive on the departments, these dedicated programs where we would just talk and unpack the curriculum and what people do with it. Um, so that'll be like one faculty, a faculty and a student. So join us for that. In the meantime, call your admission counselor and we'll get you some information about it. Um, let's see. Do, do, do. Uh, the terms of double majors, most people I read have one major and they might have also a minor. Most of that is because you have a senior thesis, so you would have to do two senior theses. And so, yeah, it's primarily one major. How do you incorporate other programs through advising? Your faculty members say, what do you want to learn? What do you want to study? And how do you craft your curriculum to make sure you acquire that knowledge? So it's not just about sort of marking another major off your list. It's about what you're excited about learning. And um, I listed, um, let's see, and... I think those are the ones I can answer quickly. I didn't get to everything. This is not intended to be exhaustive, okay? This is just, a, a, um, I don't even want to call it a teaser. This was really um, here to get some of your base questions answered to understand how you'll interact with the people who will be teaching you. 
We have robust programming throughout the year. There are dozens of virtual sessions. There are a dozen on-campus events that you can participate in to figure out if Reed is the place you want to be. And don't just think about your first year. Think about the version of you, your senior year, that you're most excited about. And if you feel like that's Reed, that might be the place where you want to be for four years. So um, to our faculty members, um, the last question I'm going to ask is um, if you, um, uh, <laughs> So if you had to, um, uh, I was going to ask you the favorite place to eat, but I think that's probably too long of a question. More specifically for Reed, if you have to give our students two words for them to think and understand Reed, two or three words, what would those two or three words be? I would say, Collaborative and curious. That's the only word. Nice. And if someone else uses it, then you can't use it. I was going to say ferociously, uh, mm, the word with, uh, now it loses me. Uh, ferociously academic, maybe. Ooh. Wait. Ooh, this is tricky to go last. All the good ones are taken. <laughs> I, I think sort of intellectual and connected, that it's it's somewhere that we really have that intellectual inquiry, but it's also really supported through the relationships. Sorry, I cheated. I added words at the end to explain. <laughs> I, I will just say that almost all of your words had both a, um, you know, sort of this um, intellectual, like this curiosity of thought are, um, you know, um, but also this emotional connection. And I think that is a really good balance for people to think about. Um, you're not just going to learn great things here, but you're also going to feel connected. You're going to have fun and you're going to have deep relationships because college is all those things. It's not one or the other. So I want to thank you all for joining us tonight. I want to thank our panelists uh, for joining us tonight. And I know we kept you a little bit long, but I hope it was helpful. Um, and y'all have a wonderful night. We'll see you soon. Thanks, Melian. Thank you. Thank you all. Good to see you.